things are going to start getting serious. We'll begin with the easy stuff. What we have camouflaged at the back of the bulkhead in there, that's a captive nut, homemade with some sheet metal and some bolts. What that is going to do is allow us to mount our coil like such. So just there, I think our coil should be low enough for it to stay out of mischief and high enough to keep out of trouble. I think it's that healthy life balance. Oh, you may also notice the um, the windshield wipers have been swapped around. That uh, that original look that was that was just me being artistic. Terrible. This bracket is the original of what was installed on the truck. Although we have done some modifications, we welded on an extra strip, five inch by one inch, up there. In its original state, it probably had a voltage regulator and maybe a fuse box, which is what it had on it when we received the truck. Now, size is relative. We have a new fuse box. And although it is quite compact, it's uh, much larger than the original fuse box. But anyway, we find a perfect home for it right here with our screws. And we drop it over here, down, and lock it in. The original fuel line's under the seat box we've done away with. And we've gone for a more direct approach through an inline fuel filter and then straight up to the pump. Now before we installed our engine, we did a radiator test fit. And you can see straight away that the radiator bumps up against those nasty little metal growths on the inside of the chassis. I hope they're not important because we performed a surgical procedure to have them removed. Now that they're gone, you can see the radiator fits. And although space is tight, it's gonna be doable. We are gonna do away with the original mechanical fan for the radiator, and we're gonna swap it out for a 14 inch RevoTech electrical one that'll be thermostatically controlled. And we may even install an override switch. This is a series three radiator and it mounts differently to the series one. So we're gonna to have to create some brackets to hold it. And this whole contraption is a little bit weighty. So the quality of steel is going to have to be at least equal to that of the front grille, which would be around 14 gauge. Now put this over on the bench. Take off that radiator. And put on our original. If you exclude the rubber buffers, then the Series 1 radiator fits pretty much flush up against the front grille, as you can see there. And the bonnet comes into contact with the top of the front grille, so you can see we have that little bit of clearance where the cap goes. So that's going to give us a ballpark idea of how to mount our new one. Alright, so we put that there. Alright, so our bonnet is going to be there, and that should give us enough clearance for the radiator cap. Its measurement from the top of the front grille is around eight inches. So if we measure that to the bonnet, we will make sure that it doesn't interfere with any of those support brackets and sits right in the middle of that little, little pocket, so to speak. We obtain some measurements and start cutting. Some steel bar from the hardware store should do the job for the top bracket. We're choosing to weld these pieces as there are three tight bends in close quarters. With the top bracket in position, our holes can be marked, punched, and drilled. Now the bracket can be attached to the grill and our radiator put into position. Close, but not touching the bonnet support plate. Distance washers elevate the radiator from the grill, and our attachment holes can now be marked, also to be punched and drilled. The embracing brackets are now to be mapped out and cut. Our little bender is not designed for this thickness of steel, yet somehow accomplishes the task. A quarter inch space is given to the bend line to account for the curve expected with the thicker steel.
For the mounting holes to the grill, we're aiming to create slots to allow lateral movement, offsetting any inaccuracies and accounting for any variation in the rubber buffers we may install. Our adjustment slots are working as intended. A lip exists on the front of the radiator mounting face that unfortunately comes into contact with the bolts that mount the side brackets. This is rectified with another minor surgical procedure in these troublesome areas. Before marking our final mounting holes, we fit the top bracket in place with our rubber buffers. Just a loose fit for now as we ensure our side brackets are clamped and the unit is as straight as possible. Using washers we ensure our gap is consistent and now our holes can be accurately marked and drilled. Alright we have our three brackets are in, there's rubber buffers at every contact point. It's time to take this big heavy lump over to the truck and do a test fit. So that's not a bad first effort at all. You can see down there, it's not quite touching, but it is very close. We have our sliding brackets so we can move our radiator over a little bit, maybe even trim off that bonnet bracket. And we have our sort of kinked hose, but it shows it's pretty close. With a little trim, we'll get a good fit. I think our concept is spot on. So when you buy these fans here, you get them to either blow or to suck. And as I'm putting mine in front of the radiator, I want it to blow in. Might be prudent just to give it a quick test. Ah! <laughs> so, it's a beautiful thing. It truly is. We our brackets up on the rack, magically turning green. The fan has been installed into the radiator with a universal mounting kit. And now the whole unit's installed into the truck. We have our hoses are looking okay. As we mounted the front grill, we used a spirit level just to make sure that it was as straight up and down as possible so the hoses weren't pulling or pushing the whole unit. The fan came with an in-hose thermostat and we found a little straight section in the lower hose and we cut and installed it there, tucked away as you can see. We've even added a bit of coolant, though we're a gallon short. We'll top that up when we get some more. The next issue we're going to turn our attention to is air filtration, which has been exceptionally vexing because it's so perplexing. It's got me baffled and flummoxed all at once. So with the bonnet closed, the clearance between that and the top of the carburetor is only three inches. Now that's only the beginning of our complications. With the center of the carburetor about there, we have a big fat support bracket that's only about three and a half inches over. And that support bracket drops about three quarters of an inch. In a perfect world, my perfect solution is gonna be this. Sits on top. There's even a little vent hose where a pipe will run hither to tither for the crankcase gases and emissions. Hmm? Now, they did say quite clearly that mounting hardware was not included, but mounting hardware does not exist might be a more accurate sort of a thing they should have said. I need the clamp and the little A-frame that fits inside. But even if I did have those things, there is no way that bonnet's going to close with that at its current height. So maybe it was never meant to be. This one here with a rubber thingamajig, but no uh, vent pipe, that's in the same puddle of frogs. It's too high. One thing that does work is this cheapest chips louvered air cleaner from Amazon. It's even got a little clamp on the neck. Works good. Fits on like such. Very low profile. We close the bonnet. It works. Albeit, albeit just. Now the thought of investing so much in a brand new engine only to use a cheap air cleaner doesn't get my juices flowing. However, the concept of this is somewhat inspirational. So we're gonna keep it aside 
for now. So those failed concepts were very similar to what was on the V8 when we received it. So we're going back to the original Land Rover setup, we have this rather expensive pipe. It has a little seal hose around the bottom of it that slips over the top of the carburetor. That. Hmm? However, when we go to close the bonnet, hey, not all is well in paradise. While I may not be the most reliable source, I can express what I believe to be true. These engines have been around a while, starting production in the early 60s or even late 50s and carrying on, I believe, into the 80s. So as you would expect, some of their ancillaries have evolved. One of the early carburetors, I suspect, was a thing called a Solex. And then came the Zenith and the Weber. Both of those two require adapter blocks, which you can see right here, and add a considerable amount of height to the unit. And underneath that is a thing called a phenolic block, which I'm not sure what it does except add a full half an inch to the height, but it must have some purpose. The Zenith and the Webers basically are the same height, so no benefit is to be gathered from there. However, mm. removing the phenolic block may be a possibility. So let's say hypothetically we were to remove the block and lower our carburetor by half an inch. And here we see it sitting there with the studs removed but in the position and at the right height that it needs to be. You can see with our Land Rover intake on that we do just have clearance beneath the bonnet. So that works, but not in the direction that we need to go, which is across to the other side of the engine. Even then, the bonnet support bracket clips our intake and pushes it down. To resolve that issue, I don't even think we've got any more to trim here. We could maybe skim off some metal at the top here, or we could even have to butcher a little archway in our support bracket. I'm not that keen on doing any of those options. I'd rather keep my phenolic block because there's another rather nasty issue. With the block in place, we can see that the throttle linkage is well clear of everything. With the block removed, that throttle linkage sinks in behind the heat shield and becomes quite inaccessible at full throttle. So what I see is us poorly resolving one issue and creating another. I want to keep the block. Next option comes from a Jeep. Now the opening of the flange is way too wide. The clamp that attaches it interferes with our choke mechanism. But you can see that it's very low. And even with the bonnet closed, it still works. This is giving me ideas. So our points of inspiration are this. Low profile. Dimensions attachment to the top of the carburetor. We're going to attempt to make our own little box. So this is what I've cooked up in my imagination. Excuse me. Let's bring in our pieces. Okay, so we've got four pieces and we've got the pipes are welded into the sheet metal. So what we're doing here is we attach them. And as you can see, it's going to lock on to our carburetor but then it's a very low profile that then jogs down so that it goes beneath the bonnet support beam and then connects to our outgoing pipe to an airbox. So the first experiment is how we're going to connect it. I have a two and a quarter inch exhaust pipe here that fits snugly into our sealing hose from the original setup that then of course drops over onto the carburetor. And then we put a clamp down there, tighten it up. Our second clamp will attach to the exhaust pipe second, and then we do the same. And then with our two clamps in place, we can see things are firm. So we're gonna put a mark right at the top of our rubber seal, and then we're gonna give ourselves a generous three quarters of an inch to make our cut. So some of that will be clearance and the stuff that's too long will grind back.
think before we get too excited about stitching this guy back up, I think we should uh, test it. <laughs> it works, and there's even room to spare. So the trick here is to stitch this thing together and make it airtight. Now the pipes are 16 gauge, but the sheet metal's 18 gauge. We're trying to balance out the usability with the strength to weight ratio and the weldability for someone of my skill set. So we've got to take our time. We have to take it very slow. We did paint the interior of the box. The edges were done with a weld through primer in the hope that it won't rust from the inside out. There's our final product, installed and ready to roll. Before we painted it, we took it into a dark room with a flashlight and gave it a pinhole test, which it passed. Surprises me even more than you. Now, if we have a look over at me made Andy's 86 inch model, you can see he's installed the original Land Rover pipe. I think he has a Zenith carburetor installed. The phenolic block's been removed, but he did run into the same issues of the bonnet clipping it when it goes down. But grinding back that little crest of steel we mentioned earlier gave him enough distance to get him out of trouble. From there, that black pipe runs into that canister, which is the old oil bath variety type. You'll see them on the old Jeeps and tractors around here. So I possibly could acquire myself one of them and modify it to fit. Instead, I've opted to purchase myself an ITG airbox with a filter inside that's small and compact and easy. However, it's also out of stock and back ordered, so I don't have it. Nevertheless, I think the best spot to install it will be on the other side of the engine bay where the battery lives. A hey, battery, that's my newfound American heritage sneaking through and corrupting the purity of my origins. Now we've got to move on to throttle linkages because back in the day, the original setup was a convoluted system of shafts and levers, springs and brackets across from the right hand side of the truck to the left and somehow hooked up to the carburetor to operate what I think is called a bell crank. On me mate Andy's truck is a left hand drive, so he didn't have to go as far, but he still came up with a very complex system of the same things aforementioned. But it works, and an incredible job was done. Pugilistically speaking, he's more of the purist, while I'm a kicker and a biter and a spitter. Whatever dirty trick's gonna get me over the finish line. What I'm gonna try and do is something similar to what was operating the V8 when we got the truck and that's a cable. Got a very clunky cable here from Amazon which is not going to get a good review. The original cable that operated the V8 was a two footer. For this job we need no less than three. So let's hold our thing in position where we think it has to go and give it a yank. So this experiment has shown us where we need our little thing to go, roughly. But how are we going to mount it, I wonder? <gasps> what is that? A random bracket just lying on the ground. What are the odds? There's three holes in this support beam and funnily enough those holes line up. Our little bracket even has an angle to facilitate a cleaner angle of attack for the cable. Now we have our cable roughly in position and we give it a pull. Hey, we see a problem straight away. A little spring in there designed to return the bell crank is not strong enough to offset the friction within the cable. So we're gonna need a second spring to help it along. And that gonna mean another bracket. If only, what? What could that be? Lurking over here, innocently hiding amongst the stuff. Another bracket. On top of our intake manifold, we have one threaded hole we'll take advantage of and a stud. The stud's gonna act as a dowel to stop our bracket from wanting to pivot. And we're gonna lock it down with one bolt. Now the spring is a bit of a trick because you don't want it so strong that it puts a lot of force on our, what must be a rather fragile lever, but you need enough snap to be able to bring it back. And what I'm seeing there 
I like it. Probably hear all those birds in the background, very raucous bunch. They go absolutely nuts for Land Rover films. It's literally filming for a live audience, but they laugh at my jokes, so I let them off the hook. A third bracket has magically turned up, and with this run of luck, we should all go out and buy lottery tickets. It's even roughly in the right spot. Now we have our lever here, loosely attached to our accelerator shaft, and we're gonna hook up our thingamajig to it and see what happens. So what my plan here is, the lever is only loose on the accelerator shaft. So I'm gonna push it down to where we meet full throttle. Make sure our accelerator pedal is flat on the ground and then tighten this up. Now look at that. That is how you do it. Celebrations may have been a little premature. Well, we can see our accelerator pedal is in far from an ergonomical position. So what we're going to do now with our lever loosely attached to the shaft is we're going to make sure our carburetor is in the throttle off position and the lever as well. And now we'll gently put our pedal into a position that we think is good. All right, now as we push down on the accelerator pedal, okay, we're only getting half of what we need to from the carburetor. We have a problem. So we're not gonna mess with the carburetor lever and we can't have our accelerator pedal in a crazy position. So the solution's gonna have to come from that one. So if we bring in some examples, we have our two levers, different lengths. Let's turn them at around 45 degrees, energize them, and now I think we'll rotate them 90 degrees. Okay. You can clearly see that the travel distance for the longer lever is much greater. And there, I think, lies our solution. So this is our original lever that's basically the same length as what's on the carburetor. And this is our sacrificial lamb, which is very similar, but slightly shorter. And we've attached a random piece of steel we found in the workshop to it that will almost, or if not double its length. Our extended lever hooked up and in place, we put it into the throttle off position and it's on loosely so it can rotate on the shaft. We just maneuver our accelerator pedal to where we think it needs to be and then we'll tighten this down. Okay, so now as we push down on the accelerator pedal to full throttle, okay, that is pretty damn close, just by doubling the length of our lever. Hey, there we go, it's working good here in the shop. The big test is gonna be how it fares over time and constant use. So we still need to install our final front wing, but tucked away in there is an alternator and a starter motor that we would like to have access to. And that brings us to the subject of what may be our final challenge, breathing life into this truck. 
For what good is flesh and bone without life? A chunk of steel in the workshop. And just like Dr. Frankenstein with his monster, we need to harness some of that savage energy that we see following the storms, tearing the sky asunder with its blinding light and its thunderous booms. But this is the domain of witches, warlocks, and wizards. So in the next episode, we'll be unlocking some of the secrets of sorcery.